Good evening, everyone. My name is Anakshi Sophie, and I'm the CEO of the Asia Society India Center. I'm delighted to welcome you all to our program today. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, Asia Society is a leading educational organization dedicated to building awareness about art and culture, business, policy, technology, and sustainability from across Asia on a global stage. At the India Center, our cultural programming is committed to recognizing and foregrounding the diversity of contemporary art, film, literature, and regional artistic traditions from not just India, but across South Asia. We have some exciting programs coming up in the next two weeks, so follow our website and social media handles to know more about what we do. The discussion today titled Art Plus Community is the second of a three-part series of virtual conversations developed in partnership with Bloomberg Philanthropies. Art Plus looks at new and unique developments within the field of contemporary art across Asia with cultural practitioners, thought leaders, artists, academics, and creative innovators. Today's webinar will investigate the complex relationship between cultural sites in South Asia and the communities they live in and work with, particularly in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic in what is now a new, unpredictable world order. We have an esteemed panel of speakers with us today, so without further ado, let me introduce the moderator, Sabi Ahmed, who will introduce the panel. Sabi is a curator and writer based in Dubai. He serves as the Associate Director of the Ishara Art Foundation, a non-profit art organization situated in Dubai that is dedicated to presenting contemporary art of South Asia and South Asian diaspora. Prior to Ishara, he was researcher and projects manager at Asia Art Archive a visiting faculty member of the Ambedkar University in Delhi and involved in the capacity of a curatorial collegiate member in international curatorial projects such as the 11th Shanghai Biennale curated by Rux Media Collective. Tabi is also on the advisory board of the Shirgil Sundaram Arts Foundation in Delhi. A tiny bit of housekeeping before I hand this over to Sabi, we'll end with a Q&A session, but we encourage you to post questions or responses in the Q&A box throughout the program. For all of you on Facebook, please drop them in the comments section. As always, our moderator will try his best to get to each question, but do forgive us in case we cannot. I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in. Keep following us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn for updates on upcoming events. A shout out to Bloomberg Philanthropies for facilitating this program and their support to the arts. And with that, Sabhi, over to you. Thank you, Nakshi. And hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure welcoming all of you to today's conversation with Shubuki Rao, with Anushka Rajendran, with Faisal Anwar. I hope I'm audible. Um, what I would like to do today uh, before beginning the presentations is uh, I want to give a quick introduction to the panel. Um, and there's, a, there's an interesting story behind it. So with that brief introduction, we will go into a presentation by each of the speakers. I will present uh, or introduce each of the speakers when they will present, um, followed by about a 20, 25 minute Q&A, moderated Q&A between myself and all of the speakers. And then we'll open, it, open the floor to uh, audience questions. We may just based on how the discussion's going and how charged it is, uh, open the floor even earlier during the moderated discussion. And as Inakshi mentioned in the housekeeping notes, Forgive us if we won't be able to address each and every question that will be uh, raised today. So um, it's a great pleasure to be in conversation with some friends and some new friends. Um, I've known some of these the panelists uh, since long, and I'm in fact a peer with one of them for an event we're organizing this year. All of them are multidisciplinary practitioners, they're writers, they're curators, they're artists. And this time around, they occupy the role of being curators of three rather large and substantial events in South Asia, which are the Kochi Musiris Biennale that Shubhagi Rao is curating, the Columboscope Festival that Anushka Rajindran is uh, curating, and the Karachi Biennale that Faisal is curating. Now, the topic, as you must have seen in the announcement for today's talk, is art plus community, art and community. and. Uh, Anushka, Shubugi, Faisal, me and Ketki, we all had a discussion prior to, to today's panel a few days ago about how we should address this 
And I just dropped a question to all of them that what does the community mean to each of you, especially with the kinds of projects that you're dealing with? And interestingly enough, all of the responses circumvented uh, the community. They circumvented defining how, how we should talk about the community. And instead they talked about strategies, strategies of engagement, uh, curatorial strategies, strategies of creating public events, um, strategies of creating interfaces. Now, these strategies of engagement are interesting because uh, in a way, in the present moment, especially after the past year, we, we are very well aware that the very basic parameters and protocols of what constitutes an event have shifted. Now, a lot of the parameters of events, so to speak, were so anchored to physical sites. So where is the venue? What is the date? What is the time? How many people can attend? How many can't? Um, is it going to be for a very local so-called audience or is it going to be for a very global audience? All of these kinds of things. Who are the participants going to be? And each of, the, each of these questions would then demand certain kinds of infrastructural uh, parameters as to what kind of even forms of labor would go into creating such an, um, such an event. Now, over the past year, with various cities going through lockdowns, various infrastructures going under huge pressure about health and care um, and um, um, the crises that have been uh, that we've all witnessed in different situations we've, we've come to realize that there's a kind of immobilization now there's a really interesting political theorist and and philosopher thomas nail who's a lot of whose work revolves around what he calls kinopolitics, the politics of movement and mobility. And he had this interesting formulation uh, a few months ago uh, around how much resource and how much mobility has been required to immobilize people, as opposed to actually uh, resources becoming less utilized because people are now moving less or traveling less. In fact, movement is such a precondition that in order to prevent movement, one actually ends up having to create so much resource, put in so much manpower, and also create new invisibilized forms of mobility of who shall be the, the so-called frontliners, the frontline workers, and these kind of things. Then coming to the context of this panel, it's not just any event. We're talking about the scale of events, which basically take two years, sometimes three years to prepare biennales. And we've seen the long discourse of biennales also, not just as events, but actually in the context of Asia as sites and opportunities and programs that also build infrastructure, build capacities. So it's not just uh, doing and organizing an event, it's actually on multiple scales, multiple dimensions that a, that a biennale operates. We also know the long discourse uh, and vibrant discourse around Biennale, such as the kinds of political dimensions that it brings with it, such as in the work of uh, Gita Kapoor and so many others who theorize around the Biennale in terms of third world solidarities. And on the other hand, more recent kind of discussions and writings on the Biennale when one thinks about Biennales in slow motion, or Biennales in infra as infrastructure building kind of uh, uh, events, or Biennales even in terms of the politics of uh, decentering and realigning of global networks. So in the context of such scaled uh, programs and events, you really then have to rethink the question of what constitutes an event of that scale, what constitutes a site, what defines a duration of an event, how do you define a local in a context where the Biennale and all of these right now have to juggle between on-site, online, on, uh, and uh, uh, sometimes a mix of both as people are now defining hybrid. Um, we also see an interesting realignment of roles or renegotiation of roles of institutions when physical infrastructures are not put on offer then what is the role of an institution? Because in many cases, the institution almost becomes like a participant on a common platform, that they're not the ones that, have, that they have designed, right? And then the role of the institution, of course, becomes a different kind of symbolic uh, infrastructure that they bring. And sometimes even in terms of the, in, uh, the invitation that goes out and the nature of that invitation. 
And in the case of at least the events that we're going to be uh, looking at today, uh, or biennales that we're going to be looking at, how do you prepare for something like this in a moment when so many delays and time lags are constants? Because if you think about it, I mean, while on the one hand, we have seen a few triennales and biennales shape out, and I'll name them in a, in a little bit, but we've also seen biennales that for the right reasons have had to be postponed. So does the curatorial mandate of a biennale change when it's been extended from a two-year gap to a three-year gap? The ideas and the kinds of concepts that you want to bring in would now respond to a shifted contemporary a changed contemporary condition. Um, we also remember uh, the, the, the kind of powerful formulation of Okwi Onvizor during his 2002 11th documenta, when he created these platforms in various cities, discursive platforms that were dispersed in the world and dispersed in different cities, which kind of offered a proposition of some kind of a decentering as opposed to some kind of centralized event. And, We've also seen biennales that have taken place since the past year, explore some of those, um, kind of take those kind of propositions forward. So you've had the Yokohama Triennale that was curated by the Rux Media Collective in exactly, well, almost a year uh, ago, uh, it opened in, uh, in July, 2020. You had the Guangzhou Biennale that was curated by Natasha Jinwala and Daphne Ayes that was that opened in September, if I'm not wrong. You had the Riga Biennale, which was uh, which was actually looking at some form of a kind of cinematic or on-screen interface with the Biennale and creating a film out of it. You've also, I mean, these are sites that I'm also engaged with. You've also seen final year display, displays and pedagogy kind of techniques shifting. And at, the very, at this very moment, the Ambedkar University seems to be doing an online display that is carried over in chapters across weeks and weeks, as opposed to a two or three day final year students display. So you, you can see the shift in te techniques, shift in methodologies, shift in protocols of these kinds of events. Now, um, as, as Shubugi, Anushka, Fasel and I were talking about community and circumventing it, a word that came up was collective strategies also, collective site formations, collaborations. And this kind of collective thinking, or at least proposing some kind of uh, uh, new scale of intimacies uh, being redrawn, uh, reminded me of something that uh, Rux had once said uh, when talking about the collective and describing what it means to be a collective. And one of the members of Rux described it as not an arithmetic or an enumeration logic, but a logic of geometry. That what it's not about how many people are in a collective, but what shapes get formed in the, the, the people who are in the collective. And similarly, we might, we might want to pay attention to the kinds of constellations that form in the present moment when one is doing events on scales like this. The, on a very small scale at the Shara Art Foundation, we have an exhibition going on called Growing Like a Tree that is curated by Sora Pura. Um, the concept note of the show was actually this uh, little drawing that he shared with us that is in the exhibition. It's what he calls a map of interconnectedness. And the exhibition that opened in January and was meant to close in May this year, we, we discussed over time that from growing like a tree, we may just want to now grow it like a forest and keep it running for the rest of the year. Rux had formulated something many years ago about a Biennale in slow motion. This is of course an exhibition, nothing close and nothing aspiring to be a Biennale, but it makes you think about how does one work in a present continuous and in a way, we're all in a position of considering present continuouses in the moment of time lags. It's not the future tense so much as the present continuous tense that we are kind of operating in. And then the question of intimacies becomes a, a question of also political solidarities, a question of drawing infrastructural kinds of uh, lines across different places, across different individuals. And on that note, I'm going to hand over uh, to each of the speakers, just as some of these prompts came up the other day, and that's why I thought I'd bring them up as, as part of the introduction. The presentations made by each of the panelists will discuss their own strategies, 
their own urgencies and how they're going about organizing these uh, programs, events, concepts, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So first and foremost, I'd like to invite Anushka Rajendran, who is a curator and writer based in New Delhi. She is, as I mentioned earlier, one of the curators of the Colombo Scope uh, Festival, a multidisciplinary festival that takes place in Colombo. And uh, this year, the edition is titled Language is Migrant. Um, we at Ishara have had the great pleasure of collaborating and partnering with Colombo Scope in organizing a reading space, a reading room project called Reading in Tongues. But I'm not going to talk about that and I hand it over to you, Anushka. You have eight to 10 minutes. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Sadi, which enumerates several of the points that came up in our conversation a few days ago. And thank you to Asia Society, India Center, and the other panelists for being part of this conversation and initiating this exchange as well. Uh, I'll just share screen. So this is the visual identity for the forthcoming edition of Columboscope Language is Migrant. Um, the, the title is in a special trilingual form that was commissioned from a local design collective called Muniac. And also thinking, responding to not just the festival concept, but also thinking about how, when a certain idea gets translated into multiple languages, what kind of consistency can we expect from various typefaces and fonts and things like that. And um, the design was uh, by Fold Media Collective, which is also the organizing entity of Columbus Co. And just to give a brief introduction to the festival and how we've been working on it before I go into various strategies and methods that we arrived at while working together as a curatorial team over the past year, um, is that um, Language is Migrant, the title draws from uh, Cecilia Vicuna's poem manifesto of the same name. And at the festival, we hold that movement is primordial to exist in, coincidentally, as we just mentioned as well. And that artists are storytellers of our times. And uh, also considering the vital role of the aesthetic and creative endeavors in creating safe spaces for testimonies to emerge and to present collective possibilities for witnessing. And um, so, uh, speaking of Cecilia Vicona, um, we are also showing a range of works by her at the festival this time. Um, and um, the, what you see right now is from the series Palabramas, which she started working on while she was in exile from Chile, where she was born after the military coup of 1973. And the body of work proposes that Words are perhaps the only acceptable weapons and considers possibilities for imagining futures from multiple evocations and meanings raised by words. Uh, and it's also interesting to think about also keeping in mind the framework within which we're speaking today. It's also interesting to consider how her works have very, even though these were made in the early 70s, the works have received renewed relevance in the recent years in Chile with the recent protests especially led by indigenous women and um, the mobilizing of art and poetry in that context. Which leads me to um, a couple of other artists we are working with from Sri Lanka at the festival. This is T. Ruksana, and this is works by T. Vinoja. And uh, both artists' works are particular in the sense that um, they emerge from their own experiences and uh, also the experiences of their peers and friends, people from their community where they are based. Um, for instance, Ruksana's work draws from her own experience and that of Muslim women in Sri Lanka that she has encountered and encompasses the trauma endured by them under structures, structures such as marriage and divorce dictated by patriarchy and aided by bureaucracy and uh, often archaic legal frameworks. And then here her works on paper also take on the metaphor of relationships and the fragility, how, that, how they're compliant to tears. And um, Vinoja's work is also, again, built from voices she's listened to, people she's met, she's encountered in Kilinochi, which is a former war zone. And also thinking about how they had to move from um, refugee camp to bunker and to home during the during the 30 year long civil war in Sri Lanka and uh, also thinking about the fact that Kilinochi is still populated by active landmines 
which were planted towards the end of the war. And uh, also thinking about disabilities as a consequence of these minefields as an everyday experience in the community and how the war is still written on the bodies of these people. So again, these are two, just two artists um, from the range of artists we have planned uh, for the festival and projects uh, where um, artists collect testimonies and often make work that remain in proximity to the people whose voices are featured. Um, another work I would like to speak about also was a strategy that emerged uh, in response to the pandemic and the lack of movement, as I mentioned earlier, that we've been encountering and still going through in many parts of the world. Um, this is uh, an iteration of Munira Al Sol's project, In Love in Blood. And uh, the starting point of the work is a list of words related to love compiled by Ibn Qayyim El Jawziya, uh, who was born in Damascus in um, the 13th century. And then we translated these words to Tamil, Sinhala, and English, and shared it with a group of around 25 women across the island for whom weaving and embroidery are a part of their everyday life. And they, from, they were invited to choose words that they relate to, and then they proceeded to embroider their own stories and perception based on this prompt. And um, usually the project involves like a communal gathering and collective thread work, but um, given this unique situation, uh, what we did was that we had a series of virtual meetings where they discussed the words that they related to specifically and wanted to work with and got to know each other and created a sense of community among these dispersed individuals across the country. And um, also then uh, kind of proceeded to work at home using materials that are easily available in their domestic spaces while continuously continuing to um, engage with each other over a WhatsApp group and sharing their work with each other. And and we were also moved by the generosity in sharing um, material with each other through various interlocutors who were able to move around. And this project is still ongoing, but has been in motion for the last couple of months. Another such project, which was again uh, sort of readapted in that involved engagement with the local context and was kind of rethought for um, the circumstances that we live in right now was Marinella Sanatore's nomadic platform, the School of Narrative Dance, which has already taken part in, taken place in many part, parts of the world. And um, this explores the potential of choreography, dance, and movement towards non-hierarchical learning and storytelling. And thinking about the body as a universal, inclusive, and emancipatory language to share experiences, new skills, and act citizenship and belonging. And um, because, again, uh, it's, again, usually um, it involves the coming together of people in a physical space. But due to the pandemic, um, the artist herself developed a video tutorial in collaboration with former participants of the School of Narrative Dance, which can be circulated easily via digital media. And uh, these tutorials are being activated in Sri Lanka, adapted and activated in Sri Lanka by two performance artists, Hasanthi Nariela and Ashley Fagnoli, who are based in the island, have been working consistently with various vulnerable groups across the island and have experience in movement therapy as well. And um, so uh, one interesting aspect of the way this project manifested was also that uh, a couple of the workshops, this included a series of workshops with the performance artists based in Sri Lanka, and the, a couple of them also involved groups that they had already been working with, strengthening and continuing those infrastructures. And there was also an open call where we invited participants. And um, hopefully this will culminate if it allows um, uh, during the new festival dates in January, from the 20th to 30th of January, if possible, we hope to have a physical performance among the participants of the School of Narrative Dance at the festival venue. Um, this is a screenshot from one of the Zoom, Zoom workshops that were held exploring movement. And also thinking about what it means, you know, for, for what it means to express through the body when um, we are all in isolation and where events are held over a digital interface such as that of a screen, like we see right now. 
This is another project uh, that we invited, which is Dora Garcia's The Hearing Voices Cafe, which is also a nomadic platform that's traveled to many parts of the world and is now arrived in Sri Lanka uh, through Columbus Go. It draws from traditions of voice hearing and designated voice hearers in various cultural contexts to explore methods of hearing, listening, and sharing to form communities of care that are politically aware uh, and emerge as emancipatory support groups, uh, which present an alternative to pharmacological approaches in conventional psychiatry. Uh, during the duration of the festival, we hope that an open air cafe in a park, in a public park in Colombo, can host a series of conversation, communal acts of reading, performances as well in collaboration with Mm, uh, Jayampati Gurge, who's emerged as the primary interlocutor and collaborator with Dora for the Sri Lankan edition of this project, who already works in existing collaborations with multiple theater groups and performance groups and continues to engage in transdisciplinary exchanges with individuals across the island, which he will also mobilize towards this um, project, the Hearing Voices Cafe. So over the, throughout 2020, we were in regular dialogue with our friends and colleagues at Chopi Mela Photography Festival in Bangladesh, exchanging ideas and strategies for a precarious year to strengthen cultural infrastructure, knowledge sharing, and artistic practices in this, um, in this very particular time. Um, uh, this, this exhibition, Anatomies of Tongues, was like a tangible manifestation of these conversations at the previous edition of Chobi Mela, Chobi Mela Shuno, that presented works by Imad Majid, Liz uh, Fernando, Hania Lutufi, and Palash Patacharji, previewing certain projects that will eventually also be presented at Columbus Cove later on. And um, since then, um, these conversations with uh, Chobi Mela have become more formalized under the ongoing series Translocal Solidarity Networks, which is supported and initiated by Gethe Institute Bangladesh as a platform for exchanging strategies and solutions for support structures, systems of reciprocity and sustenance. This is again from one of the sessions we had as part of the Translocal Solidarity Network. Anushka, time. Okay, last one. Yes. Um, this is part of a tandem residency program that we um, did, we initiated uh, as part of this edition of the festival, where we invited artists from the region um, to Sri Lanka uh, to research and produce their works for the festival, working together with a Sri Lankan artist and uh, not necessarily thinking about collaboration as working towards a common product, art product that can be realized by working together, but also thinking about the conversations and knowledge sharing that is possible through an exchange like this. And the artist travel, this happened when Borders of Sri Lanka opened up very briefly, and the artist Omar Vaseem from Karachi, Aziz Hazara, uh, which is who is of Afghan, Afga, who is uh, of Afghani origin, and uh, Rupanithan Pakiraja from Sri Lanka, and Tisataradaniya from Sri Lanka as well. So they traveled across the island, engaged in various activities, um, met with cultural um, practitioners and um, scientists, and but botanists in some cases, and. Um, uh, based in the South and in Jaffna, worked on the research and production of the pro projects, thinking about exchanges and continuing cultural conversations, especially in a moment where few such options exist. I will, uh, if we don't have time for this video, I will end here and maybe we can come back to it later on. Thank you very much, Anushka. Yeah. Thank you. We'll have a lot to pick up on and you can also bring up some things in the Q&A you wanted to highlight any point. Thank you again. Um, I'd like to now call Faisal, uh, Faisal Anwar, who describes himself as a hybrid artist. He's working between Canada and Pakistan. At the moment, he is in Toronto, and I believe it's late at night uh, at your end. No, it's, it's morning time. Uh, early morning, sorry. It's late at night at Shibugi's end. And uh, Faisal is um, the, the upcoming edition of the Code Shib uh, Karachi Biennale curator. So, Faisal, over to you. Anyone who wants to look up their bios and details, please log on to the Asia Society India Center website and you'll find further information. Faisal, over to you. Thank you, Sabri. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Asia, um, Asia Society, for, for inviting. 
Uh, let me share my screen. All right, thanks. <clears throat> so um, I, I thought I'll just start with this quote, which I really um, admire. And I think it, it retrospect uh, with the realities of present time. Um, and when we look at our um, present realities and um, look inwards and outwards, there's a there's a lot more which we need to reflect on and understand uh, what's what's happening around us in, in and especially in the past two years and and what is actually our present reality i mean there are many ways to look at this 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 question right i mean at one at one one level we are living in isolation and on the um on the other other hand, uh, we are kind of forced to adapt um, digital lifestyle, which I think is a really interesting shift. Um, and and I always wonder um, this transformation, which happened in the past um, two years or so how it's going to reflect on the cultural institutions and art institutions and across the multiple industries and what's going to be next right how uh, this manifestation is going to impact how we are going to relate with it and how it's going to going to change the way we work we conceive and we plan and I think these are really interesting uh, questions for us to connect and talk more. And what is the need of the present time, right? I mean, if we look at uh, these, uh, these cultural and social shift, there's a very clear evidence of the problems and the challenges the world is facing. So the question of climate crisis, the question of disbalance in power, the question of how we are, how we are, um, uh, you know, um, uh, where the power is, and I, I think those are the really interesting, interesting perspective. And I hope that we will reflect upon it and 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 see if we can make better choices as societies. And and really, it's it's for me, it's a time to reflect, and it's time to evolve, and it's time to change. Um, Marshall McLuhan talks about, uh, uh, in an in a, um, extension of man, the idea of medium is the message. And it's really interesting perspective, which I think really resonate in contemporary times as well. How the message, how the message, uh, how the medium kind of become itself a message and how the message which we are delivered through medium changes our perceptions. <clears throat> and, 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 and we, you know, according to Greg, our world is going to change more than in the next 20 years than in the previous 300 years. Of course, it's a, it's a statement, but I think there's a lot of interesting perspective here for us to look into. And what is the change? what are our contemporary mediums and how are we reflecting towards it? <clears throat> this is a pretty interesting data um, which actually resonate where we are as society, where we are as, as communities around the world. 7.3 billion people are using our, these social, digital, real-time, culture, which is a pretty interesting shift, uh, which happened, this is the data, which is January 2021, which sort of gives us this a whole new perspective of where our communities and where our uh, cities exist these days. If you look at this internet adaptation by countries, this is pretty interesting the way, you know, it, it moved, right? It shifted, you know, the worldwide is 59%. And now we are looking at 99% of adaptation in, in the UAE. And 
And, and it, if we reflect back and see the trajectory of these adaptation, this is pretty interesting, alarming, um, uh, I would say, um, uh, in futuristic strategy, which we have to think through as a cultural organization. And I, I found this pretty interesting, you know, the reasons of spending time and, and, and there are some pretty interesting um, um, uh, sort of variables, seeing what's being talked about. I think it's quite interesting. Um, filling spare time, 36.9% are spending time here. So the, the, for me, the question is, uh, is, it, is it what the reality of the present time is? Are we ready to, to look beyond our communities, our, um, our um, audience, and what actually that means when we think about curating uh, large scale um, festivals like biennials, how these gonna reflect on, and what actually that even means in many ways. Yeah, I mean, social data spend time every day, it's pretty alarming. We all know this is happening, but I think these are real tangent points for us to sort of really think through um, as, a, as, as a group. And I would love to touch upon these in our conversation as well, uh, if we find some time. So uh, actually our, our cities, live without borders and they act like portals. Um, and these portals are consistently uh, in a real time dynamic and generating this data, generating this news, generating this interplay of information and all that, all that in, uh, information resonate and transcend for all of us in our own space where we are um, in the world. Um, so what I, I'm just sharing one of my work where I kind of look at this shift in the communities and bring communities as part of the work. This is the work which, which we've been um, um, uh, com commissioned by Ahan Museum in Toronto. This is a real time um, hashtag and Twitter based um, uh, work where the communities are engaging with the hashtags and the style making are happening in real time based on the conversation and it's constantly evolving. And I think this is one of the strategies which I feel moving forward, it's going to be more and more how we can bring in communities into the conversation, how we can bring in communities as part of the work and how it's manifesting um, to the larger uh, audience. So the question I have, that. yeah, the question I have, who and where is our audience? What is the change? What is the opportunity? What is the public space? What is a private space? And what is the social space? I think we'd love to talk more in our conversation to collaborate and really see if that makes sense in our conversation. And I think when we look into the shift, uh, I think there are, there are these four levels of shift which I foresee. So disruptive digital transformation and adaptation across all industries. It's a change in the mindset. I mean, imagine I'm sitting in Toronto and I'm, I'm curating a biennial uh, from my studio and connecting across the world with the artists and the organizations in Karachi, which I think is a pretty interesting shift. And the decentralization, was decentralized power and the work dynamics, which I think we all know, is a really interesting shift as well. And also looking into the new emerging economy, which is in the making like NFTs, the blockchain and all these new perspective, which is coming um, 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 for, for all of us. Um, for, for Karachi Biennial, um, I, I'll just talk about the thematic premise. So the th thematic premise which I'm working on is the collective imagination now and the, and the next. 
And um, I hope we all will come together, hope the world will be open next year. And you are all are welcome to join and celebrate with all of us. That being said, uh, I'll just pause it here and then we wait for our conversation later. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Faisal. I suppose it's deliberate that you spoke so little or practically almost evaded the question of the Biennale. And I hope we'll get to pick it up uh, on how you're, how you're bringing this together, even though it's a year from now uh, in the Q&A round. Yeah? So now we move to Shubhagi Rao, who is an artist, who is a writer, who is an interloper, who uh, has multiple identities, some we can recognize, some we don't, who is also a friend. And she's the curator of the Kochi Museum Biennale that was going to open last year. It is now expected to open in November this year. Um, we shall see. We shall also like to hear from Shubuki what it's been like to put this together and how her strategies of working on this, building this, um, have, have shaped, including the time lag that has also factored in. So over to you, Shubuki. Thank you, Sabi. Um, thank you, H Society. And I want to thank Anushka and um, Faisal also for what they've just presented. Um, so I actually, I'm going to be speaking um, briefly. While Shubuki, yeah. it's interesting how Anushka's presentation marked out very specific locations and their dynamics that she wants to bring together. And Faisal spoke about this kind of globalizing force, of, which we also know is riddled with all kinds of uh, loopholes and blind spots. So maybe in the discussion, we can touch on some of these things. Shubuki. But thank you, nevertheless, um, Sabi and Asia Society for this. And thank you, all of you for, for tuning in. Um, I, th I really enjoyed the earlier presentations, I think also because it touches upon, again, what we had mentioned um, in our previous conversation with Sabi. But I'd like to speak very specifically about just one point. Um, and um, I, I think it's something that I think is, is important here because it's I, I want to just talk about one aspect. Um, and the reason for that is because I'm really uncomfortable speaking from authority. I'm really aware that I'm I'm a former Indian <laughs> um, who has not lived in India for 20 years, now curating um, some South Asia's largest Biennale. Um, and that is, as you can imagine, it comes with a bonus of not being beholden to any parties, which means that you can come in with so-called fresh eyes. But it also means that when we talk about community, I will not speak from any position of authority here. My knowledge base is not is no longer India, and it's no longer the region um, in which the Biennale is taking place. So I want to be very upfront about this. It also means that for me, Another reason is because I don't think our community is a single-celled organism. It's not the bog. Um, and I'm also very suspicious of people who speak on behalf of community unless they're from within that community already. So I therefore disavow any um, uh, attempts to pin me down later and force me to speak about any Kochi-specific community or subcontinent subcontinental-specific community because I don't have that currency of knowledge at this moment anymore. Having said that, curatorial research is also a form of information gathering. And one of the ways I had to approach this was to think again from my own artistic method. And that is something that I find, it really stood me in good stead here. Now, when I say artistic method, I don't mean the, the, the approach that one takes as an artist to build a project or to build a work. I tend to embark on very long-term projects and a 10-year and project, for instance, in means you really have to listen. In other words, you take a thought to its logical conclusion, no matter how long it takes. You don't always have that luxury of time with the Biennale. Well, as it turned out, the pandemic gave me extra time, but I'd already completed my curatorial research, research from then before that. So how do I actually formulate a curatorial strategy based on the idea that one simply listens not only to an artist describing their conceptual framework or the artistic um, sort of method or the approach, but you're also listening to to whom they owe the, that debt of knowledge. To from where have they gathered the information or the 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 urgency with which they they um, sort of are seized by certain ideas and not by others. What is what is their idea? What constitutes their localness? And also, this is really important because if we are talking about a biennale, a biennale is a flattening spectacle. It's a it's a gigantic exercise, and it's one of the ways in which original context gets erased very easily. So it's all very well to do the 
you know, for me to say as a curator, I'm bringing in um, South South conversations. It's it's very easy for me to say things like, oh, you know, I'm looking at these specific regions. But really, how do you retain that original context? How do you retain that fidelity that artists have to their original ideas? At the and and the and the debt that owes to their communities because communities after all and I will always use a singular when I speak about communities not community because it's not singular communities are in a sense so multiplicit I mean the, you can't just say you're from one community you you can't say that it that's not how it works and it's given that there's intersectionality within the idea of communities as well and that's something that has always informed my artistic strategies and I, it was really lovely to see how that. That's something that a lot of artists already have. I mean, we all recognize this. For those of you who are listening who are artists, you know this already. It's just that we don't often articulate it very clearly in the work. But when you do a studio visit, you get to see this. It's apparent then. And it's also why we can forge instant um, moments of understanding and comprehension across borders, across language um, um, barriers, across other such um, um, well, obstacles, simply because we understand the ability of artistic method. And the primary artistic method I want to talk about is the ability to listen. And this ability to listen really refers to the ability to um, understand that every every conversation, for instance, that I've had with artists that I, I, I during my curatorial research, they're all very clear most of the time about um, why they're making things in a certain way. They're used to that spiel that they engage, that, that, that they invoke every time they meet a curator. But that's not the, that's not particularly interesting anymore. Past that whole professional, you know, the um, sort of uh, presentation that a lot of artists have been trained to do. If you look beyond that, actually, what's so much more interesting when you finally get to talk to this with them is that moment of of discussing why they made a swerve or a shift from certain works towards others, why certain why certain methods evolve. And that evolution in the in how artists listen and how they interpret, that evolution is actually, I think, at the core of my curatorial strategy. And I'll explain what I mean by that. As an artist, I myself am driven by many things, but the main is the main thing, of course, is how I situate myself in the world. What what and it doesn't only mean my current reality, it means also historically. So my responsibility, again, is not just to our species, but also to the planet to recognize that there are so many different ways in which we can strengthen bonds of communities, yes, but also strengthen the idea of exchange. Because as I mentioned already, a lot of people who speak from a position of authority are also gatekeepers. They're the ones who gatekeep cultural exchange. They mediate cultural exchange. They're the ones who decide who gets the gets the megaphone and who doesn't, who gets sent to stage and who doesn't. And I've always been very uncomfortable with those ideas that that when you have to, as a curator, enter a region, you have to go through somebody who recommends who you meet. And that primary form of gatekeeping during my curatorial research, research is something I bypassed a lot, which brings me actually to my second curatorial uh, artistic strategy, sorry, um, which is to be covert. I think there's a lot of, work that can be done in very covert ways. I've often thought of myself as a sapper. A sapper is actually the lowliest of the, uh, uh, in terms of in military terms. Um, they're very often the people who have the dirty job of sort of tunneling and they, uh, under um, um, fortifications and then blowing it up. But it's, it's it doesn't have the glamour of other um, overt military forms of heroism. But what a sapper does essentially, and this is something that I, I have tried to do, I'm still learning how to do it because it, as I said, it's an evolution. And that is very simple. You listen, you learn, you understand the terrain. You have to understand the terrain before you go in. And then you actually tunnel under at pre-existing structures or ideas or systems of thought which are dominating. This means, number one, you do not look at the market. You do not, do not look at what is current right now and what's interesting at that moment. This would mean really good stead because if I'd done that, my my artist list would have already been obsolete because of the pandemic. Okay, so it I think it's really important to look past what is current, what's what's trending, and so on. Um, but actually, really also listen to why artists may have a particular resonance within their region. How do you get? How do you? How do you? Um, how do you support that? How do you translate that without overwriting when you show them in an international Biennale? So this to me was actually very interesting. And that's what I mean by generate new thought and action. I'm not going to sp speak about specific artists in, in, from Kochi because I think it, it sort of then emphasizes certain practices over others. So that's why I'm very clearly only speaking from my work as an artist. 
because it definitely there's a relationship between Kochi and and my work as well. Um, this is actually an image that I that it's a film still from something I, I took a, lo- a while ago, and this is actually bullet holes in library books. And the, this actually to me speaks of of something that I just want to. I think it's the main driving point of today that I want to put across. It's easy to despair. It's also easy to recognize that, the, that yes, a lot of us are privileged. As I was telling Sabi earlier, I, I do, someone had mentioned this to me. We're all in the same storm, but we are not all in the same boat. So we have to recognize when it comes to pandemic um, and also challenges that we face that it's, they all, they're very, very different. And a lot of us have, uh, have it a lot easier than others. Having said that, it's easy to also be overwhelmed with the state of, the, of, of our current realities and, uh, you know, as we can see them. But it's easy to also imagine that power resides in the hands of the very few. It's true it does, but it is also very easy to take back that power. The reason I'm showing this to you is because bullet holes in a book, that's an act of utter futility. Yes, they had the guns. Yes, they had the machine guns. Yes, the librarians didn't. Yes, the librarians couldn't save all the books, but this has not damaged the, this. Is, okay, it's damaged the binding a bit, but it's still a readable book. You can't, it's harder than you think to destroy knowledge. This is a burnt book. Okay, you can't actually open it properly. It's in the hands of a very young restorer. This is the first book she chose to restore. It's a manuscript. It's not even a copy of a book that you can just, you know, order off Amazon or something. It's an original manuscript, Ottoman era manuscript, right? It's been burnt in an act of violent rage from by hateful people. Um, They had all the power. They set this library on fire. But when you open this book, you see, look at the damage. Charred edges. The text is absolutely readable this is the point i'm trying to make it's it's harder than people expect to actually break the spirits of communities it's harder than than you know yes they may have the power but that power can be very easily undermined this is something i wanted to this is actually the driving force what i wanted to say because it's not enough for me to say okay this is my curatorial um, framework you can go read it online if you want to i'm not going to regurgitate it here Um, i'd much rather actually speak about the fact that one of the things I believe in as part of my my artistic strategy and which is at the forefront of my curatorial one, my belief, my optimistic belief, and you can call it naive and I will defend it to the to the end. My optimistic belief in the power of us as, as a species to find joy, to, to build things together because we are naturally sociable. We instinctively understand that our survival depends on our bonds of fellowship with each other and community is not a fixed thing it is not only your your ethnic or religious group and so on it crosses across multiple lines and artists don't exist outside of their communities they have, they have their own communities already before you even bring them into a biennale so what i've been trying to do is listen to that find a way it's it's probably doomed to failure because to be honest how do you translate something like that but i'm i'm, I'm definitely that's definitely been my my focus and i'd like to leave you with just that idea um that d- despair is something we we are surrounded by in this moment but it's also not the be all and end all this will also pass thank you thank you very much Shubhuki. thank you everyone all three of you who've uh, i think put together some really good ideas and, and very compelling thoughts um and all of you also articulated in very specific ways how you are thinking about this term community even though we seem to have circumvented it previously i think it's come back um in in anushka's presentation we kind of saw a dispersal of and various connections being made between territories between specific practices that are also engaging with different communities in those places in fast health there was a kind of invocation of we are a global community perhaps and maybe borders are no more is what you seem to be suggesting um is it is it not let's discuss and then shubugi working really against the grain talking about the complexity of original contexts but also complicating context. And with that, I wanted to actually ask uh, all three of you, since we're kind of in this place right now, in this moment where thinking about practice territorially becomes a little difficult. Um, And um, what I mean by that is that um, it's not, it's like, what does Pochi, Karachi and Colombo mean for each of you? As you were as you were putting together these biennales, because on the one hand, Shubuki says that um, biennales tend to flatten 
contexts and they, they have a flattening kind of drive. Uh, a, a, a point I would want to contend with Shibugi, uh, I feel they're, they're much more than flattening. Um, and also that they're never about just one event. In fact, they have to be seen in constellations with other biennales mm -hmm. because there's a circulation of forms, ideas, practices, uh, and people. Yes. Um, Sorry, just, uh, just, yes. just, I'm going to interrupt you very quickly. I yes. said flattening of original context. Original context, but I yes. want to pick up on Not the point of, the of original work. context. Yeah. Yes, no, yeah. good point, exactly. So my question right now is, how does one, how do each of you look at the context of the sites where the biennales and festivals are taking place? What is the context? of what, you, what you're proposing? What is the context that you're working with? Is it a, is it a global context? It is, a, is it a Colombo con, context? Is it a Kochi and Karachi context? What does it mean? What does Kochi mean for you, Shubugi? What does Colombo mean? So let's go in the same order of everyone's presentations. Anushka, what is Colombo in Colombo scope this time for you? How do you, how do you work with this territory, this context, um, and its own histories and layered kind of contemporaries. Um, I'm glad you asked that question because I also mm. saw another question in the Q&A Q mm. that addressed how I was working in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh mm. being Indian. Of course, my gaze will always be that of an, as be that of an outsider. But first of all, in keeping with what Shibigi also said, there are huge teams of people behind festivals and biennials such as this. So if I am speaking as a curator, it's I'm not speaking just for myself. I'm supported uh, most closely by the artistic director of Columboscope, Natasha Janwala, who's been based in the island um, for, for many years now. And uh, Shanika Pereira, who's also on the curatorial team and has been working with the festivals almost since its inception. And of course, our wonderful team, who's, whose contributions have all I loved this manifestation to happen. And um, but personally, I um I I was able to spend two months in uh, Colombo at the invitation of Tirtha International Artists Collective back in 2015. And since then I've continued to engage with the context, stayed in touch with the artistic community there. Um they uh, I've worked with them in several of my projects, and it was always almost a design desire to work more closely in the region, in place, in Sri Lanka for a very long time now. So the invitation from Columboscope was actually uh, a point, a punctuation in the series of um, engagements that I had already had with Sri Lanka. And also uh, thinking about how certain artistic practices in the region um, relates very closely to my research since 2011 and 12, which has um, been around cultural and political trauma and aesthetic responses to it, which several practitioners, creative practitioners in Sri Lanka have actively been working with. And I've learned so much from the context. And uh, so this has just been a culmination of several strands of exchanges and friendships over several years that manifested in this. And then also thinking regionally, um, I spoke a little bit about uh, the Translocal Solidarity Networks, which is an initiative we uh, work with Chobi Mela on and the Gethe Institute in Dhaka. What does it mean to build a festival in a region as South Asia? And the unique challenges, if one would understand more often than not are similar in terms of not just, even in terms of very practical issues like this, infrastructure, right? Like physical infrastructures and building it, creating it, accessing venues, navigating censorship and political, very unique political contexts that are present across the region. And um, so there is this conversation and I believe that more than um, saying that a Sri Lankan is allowed to only speak about Sri Lanka, I feel that there's a lot more that we are able to generate through these regional conversations as well, which is kind of how I locate myself working. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Faisal, you made this provocative statement that maybe we're entering a world without borders in a time when actually crossing borders becomes even more difficult because it's not just visas, it's even whether you've got a vaccine or not. And of course, within South Asia, there's all these other long historical complications of crossing borders. So how are you looking at Karachi in Karachi Biennale? Yeah, thanks, Abhi. Um, well, um, I think that the, 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 there are two ways to look at the context, right? There's, uh, there's my own context, which is um, sitting in Toronto and reflecting on the, on the culture and the city. And then there's a context of Karachi itself. 
And so what, what my strategy so far is I'm looking into a global context and the regional context uh, in the city level context. And, and that's, that's what, what, what I feel is, is going to be um, um, uh, an interesting um, perspective to bring in. I mean, if you look at Karachi, it's 24 million people. It, it has history of so many diverse immigrants communities coming in uh, from India, from a, across region, multiple languages, multiple food, multiple cultures. It, there are so many cities within the city, which I think is pretty interesting. So what I, my, my strategy is, is to actually look um, in inwards and also outwards as well and, and developing um, thematic strategies and and uh, presentation strategies to actually try to b bring uh, work from outside from the gallery space and the location and bring into the uh, community centers, uh, which which tend to be a really interesting uh, challenge, right? I mean, you, you, you cannot invite people in because of their social status, because of their cultural uh, relevance, because of who they are. So what, what I'm in, engaging with this methodologies and the strategies is to bring out work and bring that work to them and see if that resonate more and bring bring us into this cycle of looking into the global context because I, I, I believe we are not living in isolation anymore. And that's what I'm talking about when we say we live without borders. We, at this point, can easily, I mean, we know each and everything about what's going on in the cities we live in globally. So if, to me, if we look at from that perspective, this, this spontaneity, this living in 24 seven in this dynamic uh, space, do bring this con uh, conversation of how the cultural context, is it shifting? Is it, is it um, morphing? It, is it becoming um, monolith kind of, perspective? Are we going to, towards to the wrong side of globalization or we are trying to figure out where, what is our identity? And I think that to me is a, is a very blurred line at this point, which is one of the strategies I'm trying to sort of peel through um, as a curator. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Faisal. Um, there's also a lot of discussion about globalization and easy movement. And increasingly, one has come to realize that it might be movement, but there's also different asymmetries in what moves where, which directions of flights and cargoes are made easier compared to other directions of flights and cargoes, where vaccines reach first, where they don't, um, those kinds of things. Um, Shubugi, in your formulation of the original context, uh, how do you negotiate with the original context in which artists are operating vis-a-vis -vis the original context of Kochi. Uh, mm. Are you working with some kind of an idea of an original context of Kochi in which other contexts will be residing or temporarily mm. cohabiting? I think the point of what I was saying was that there is no original context to Kochi that I can apprehend, right, I as see. an outsider. That's what the point I was trying to make first. Sorry, Anushka, okay. I think it may have been uh, misunderstood. I, I, when I say speaking from position of authority, I'm talking about people who declaim on behalf of other people when they have very little engagement with that community. Uh, what you're doing and what Columbus Scope does, of course, does not fall under that. Um, I think what I should have been perhaps clearer, but I was so aware of my eight minutes. <laughs> um, what I mean is that for, for very long, we've actually, uh, our introduction to most regions that we don't often engage with or have very little or no engagement with comes through certain standard channels. Of, um, and I think that's that's something that we did, we definitely need to append. In fact, the, the, the work that you're doing, for instance, Anushka and Columbus Scope, uh, with Columbus Scope also, is um, a form of knowledge making also. So I just want to be very clear about that. <laughs> so I hope you didn't think there was any aspersion that was being cast here. Um, I think I, I, when I say speak from position of authority, what I also meant is what authority does is it re, it re, works original context okay original context is not a singular thing again also so now i think when we're discussing it it might it runs the danger of being over discussed and then pinned down into a point of origin 
but there's no they very often is not a singular point of origin it's like trying to trace the genesis of something there is no singular genesis i think we can kind of agree on that mm. um that kind of that also i think privileges the idea that what came first should be more pure and i don't believe in that either i don't think any of us really do exactly. um yeah so i think when i speak of original context what i mean is the the urgency or cogency rather the cogency of a work or a series of work or a body of work because very often i'm thinking about bodies of work that have been built over time and um within certain spaces within certain realities um then when you visit them after the fact especially as an outsider how does that how, for the artist to translate it verbally and also rely on the artwork to do its own um to initiate its own dialogue so to speak with the person viewing it the outsider i think that all of that is really precious and has to be very gently teased apart because if you rush through studio visits you miss all of that you're looking at the surface of things you're looking at the surface at the image of a work and you you're you're apprehending other points that perhaps are not really relevant and you're not actually listening to where this is coming from so the act of listening here doesn't involve just not interrupting it also involves really trying to figure out why this person chose this artist chose to describe her work in this way why did she why did she feel that there was a primacy about this aspect but knows that this she can just sort of let it let it slide because she probably suspects you'll understand it already because there's a kind of um i won't say globalized but there's a kind of understanding because that language exists beyond you know um region um this is evident when we look at the way in which we are but in any conversation about decolonizing this is something that comes up again and again because you have to talk about local strategy strategies that are particular to that museum that curriculum that that of course but you doesn't mean you ignore the tools and strategies that are available from other um um regions because uh, that are also doing that act of decolonizing right or dismantling and i think this is what i'm i was the point i'm trying to make here we cannot rely on people uh, on thinkers on on people who have speechified i think the the ideas of artistic um um production exhibition and consumption i think we have to dismantle those modes um and that's sort of what i i meant again as i mentioned i think before we started this i said already savi that 8 minutes is going to it's either yeah. going to be everything or nothing so yeah, no. for me it's a killer to do an 8 minute thing so i i'm quite sure I, I, that sort of you know please feel free to sort of misunderstand everything except because that's oh, also no. something i, I, I can I imagine so yeah so to answer your question directly what i mean by original con- contexts are not genesis of things um i if you actually you, you know if when you overhear because i love overhearing and something i've done ever since i first started as an artist i should pretend i was not the artist so i could eavesdrop i love doing that i still love gallery sitting for that reason too mm-hmm. um and and it's not about my works but anyone's work it's just mm-hmm. the stuff you overhear there's a kind of glibness that most that you hear most often mm-hmm. um and you hear it a lot in biennales because of the pressure of time you don't have the time and energy to actually to spend with with work in a biennale simply because of the sheer volume of what you're looking at and if we're talking about things like say uh you know it's it's hot and humid it's cozy i mean i i've seen people just um mm. i remember one one woman who came to to aspen wall and she only wanted to see othlets work because that what she came to cozy to see and she didn't see anything else yeah and she's quite a well known person trying to name her but i think you'll have to wait for my memoirs point i'm trying to make is that it's really easy to also ignore the the act of discovery and you can only discover if you actually just just take a little time with things so this act of listening involves a kind of temporal pause as well um and what i meant by original context here again refer to the this is what artists do anyway and it i think as viewers it's great if we can do that to them for them as well Thank you. Thank you for clarifying Shubugi. Also <laughs> I spend a it, lot of my time clarifying. <laughs> no, no. It's it's good. I mean clarifying also because I think a lot of people are concerned with that question. There's a question for Anushka about how do you think about your identity in your curatorial work as someone who's Indian based in Delhi curating for places like Columbus Scope and Chobi Mela. So there is there are questions which I think are talking about context location where you're based where you're committed to and how what you bring when you bring when you go to some other place and actually uh, it it brings an important point i think for us to think about not just within a pandemic context but also in these events that take place for a longer longish duration um 
on a scale which is actually inviting a large group of people um, across demographics is that on the one hand, um, there's this hyperbole of, uh, of extreme globalization that all context is lost in a, in, a, in a space like a Biennale, as if every context just get flattened out. And on the other, in the pandemic context, it's as if all context is suddenly just vanished, uh, like we're in a space that is completely despatialized. Whereas actually, I think what both instances often bring to light are not despatialization through either uh, uh, erasure of context or despatialization because of confinement, but rather respatialization. There's always new alignments of spaces, conversations, residues that are left behind, I think, which kind of came through in each of your presentations. What I'm going to do now, in the interest of time, is to uh, pick up a few questions which, in my view, have been answered, but I'm going to read them out just in case any, any of the three of you want to answer them. And I'm going to pair all of them, uh, the ones that seem, in my view, to be answered, but I'll bring it up in any case. So one anonymous attendee asks to all the panelists, how do you define the word community? Are you part of it or outside of it when you curate? And this, in my view, also connects with another question, which is, uh, by another anonymous attendee, a large part of the community is also the artistic labor that makes these cultural sites come to life. Could you talk a bit about that? So I think it's also a, a kind of more nuanced understanding of the community uh, with, with, which, with whom we work and a lot of invisibilized labor oftentimes. And then there's a question to, that was addressed to Anushka, which I, I saw that Anushka read and answered, how do you think about identity in your curatorial work as someone who's Indian based in Delhi and curating for places like Columboscope and Chobi Mela? Now, these are three questions. If you want to quickly take them, if you feel you've answered them, you have the absolute right to say, I think we've discussed this. Maybe we can move on to something else. Uh, we do have less time and we have quite a few other questions. So your call. Um, there's, uh, let me just add one more, which was to Shubugi, but maybe all of you can also pick up on this. Our communities and publics, the same thing. Um, from Kirkul Hunyu uh, Papinyo. Um, any, any immediate answers? Do you feel you have addressed it and it would be like repeating yourself if you were to go back to it? I just want to add one thing, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which is the uh, difference between community and public. Mm -hmm. And I, I think these are two different things uh, mm -hmm. in, in many ways. Just want to say that. Mm -hmm. Anyone wants to elaborate or uh, should we move? Yeah, I would like to add that as very often, I think this came up in our internal conversations a few days ago, but uh, just to reiterate, um, there's often a mixing up of audiences and publics. And uh, audiences is a quanti quantifiable number, the number of people who drop by or, you know, statistics, which doesn't really translate into actual engagement or even form a public around the work. Whereas um, ideally, publics would be a more engaged audience within that context. And um, also thinking about various levels of publics. I mean, not hierarchically at all, but various kinds of publics in a way. Uh, for instance, the contingent communities that evolve around the body of a work, right? Or even thinking about, for instance, uh, in response to, in relation to a couple of artist projects that I presented, um, such as Marinara Sanatore's and um, also Munira Al Sol, uh, thinking about the primary community around the work as the collaborators within the work, we're engaging in conversations and making it. So that becomes one level. And then again, Transnocal Solidarity Network, thinking about a regional community of art workers and what we can learn from each other and how we can support each other. So there are multiple ways to look at this. And some of this are dispersed. Some of these can be located together occasionally, not always perhaps. So I feel that's, that's just a point that I want. Do you want to add or shall we move? There are many questions. No, I think we can move on because I yeah. think we've addressed this. I yeah. just have to say I agree with what Anushka just said, especially mm -hmm. your first point. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you. Um, actually, it reminds me of something that James Baldwin would say when he was asked that, how do you anticipate your readers? How will they know and understand your work? Is your writing too esoteric maybe for some of these people? So what is your relationship with your reader, your public? And he says that when I write, I entrust the reader as opposed to exactly. make my work accessible to the reader. It's a mm -hmm. bit like sharing a secret. I entrust mm -hmm. my work and my words with you. And it's a very beautiful way of thinking about um, with, whom you're, with whom you're in conversation with, even if that uh, interlocutor is a stranger, anonymous, not visible to you. Uh, 
moving on, uh, there is a question from Shabir Mir. Amazing part of Binali's is that the art is brought to public space places where potentially whole society can experience it. My question is that how can we bring the artists to the Binali outside of the gallery circles? Artists who are not in the limelight but are creating impactful stuff. And in my view, this question is sort of pointing to artistic uh, curatorial research. How are, you, how are you guys doing curatorial research and finding um, interesting voices that you want to be in conversation with for your Biennales? Um, can I just pair this with another question that has come from Mansoor Ali? Uh, uh, Shubuki, as an artist and teacher, I can relate to your curatorial note and approach about community, but how do you see works being encouraged for being regional identity specific? Mansoor Ali from MSU Baroda. These two questions, anyone? Artist and curatorial research, and um, how do you see works being encouraged uh, for being regional or identity specific? I'm not sure I fully understand that question. Encouraged because they are regional or encouraged to appear regional and identity specific? I'm not sure I fully uh, mm -hmm. understand that. I may have misread it. That's a, yeah. So maybe we'll see if Mansoor would like yeah. to. Uh, It'd be add great, Mansoor. Further. If yeah, if you can just clarify that, then it's Is a lot it, easier yeah. for me to answer. Correct. And uh, with regard to uh, curatorial research, let me pair that with another question then, which is um, uh, such events tend to happen in big urban spaces in South Asia, um, Kathmandu, Colombo, Karachi, Mumbai, Kochi, yet much of our population is in rural areas. So what happens to the idea of the community in these contexts? Is authenticity compromised? Again, we, we're not quite sure whether it means the community that is going to come and visit the Biennale, mm. or is it uh, artists who are from context mm. uh, where how did you do your research do you want to say a little bit about your research very quickly of how you're how you go about um, uh, meeting people I won't say selecting how you go about because obviously any biennale only is the tip of the iceberg of mm. a much larger field that gets produced of conversations research that then go beyond the biennale so how do you end up finding people you are speaking to very quickly Who are you asking? Everyone. Oh. Hmm. Anyone can go first. Anushka? Sure. Um, with Columbuscope, about 50% of the artists are um, Sri Lanka based. So I did spend almost a month in Sri Lanka towards the end of 2019 renewing um, uh, knowledge of practices that are based in Sri Lanka already and also kind of. Um, discovering new practices and traveling to said rural areas as well and or inviting them to come to Colombo so I can meet them and engage with them. And uh, Columbus Scope, as a as a, even as a festival platform, c considers its work as ongoing. So it's not an event that kind of folds and unfolds, but believes in doing work that leads up. So that's how all of the activities that we spoke about also happens. So there's a constant conversation that goes on in Sri Lanka with the local community at Columbus Scope, which constantly adds to the network and the, builds the festival community basically, which becomes a valuable resource while working on a project like this. But I think it would also be interesting to mention another project that I'm working on, which is uh, the Asian Art Biennial in Taichung. Um, and um, over there, there has never been a research visit because I've been working remotely all through. Right. And uh, so in there, what I have done is locate my vantage point specifically in Delhi, South Asia, and responding to the larger framework of the biennial through this position, being very conscious of it. And uh, also the invitation came from a from the possibility of international exchanges in a time like this and including various perspectives and points of view in relation to the concept. So that lo location is really important to that project because I do not have as much of a claim over the local community and also this project is something that will travel in various ways and also exist online and be accessed by a wide range of people. And also recognizing that their regional research, a lot of it was supported by friends in various parts of the world whose practices I felt that I could relate to and not necessarily who I identify as gatekeepers. But And for me, the challenge is also figuring out a way how to acknowledge this informal economy of friendship, especially when it contributes to research and for grounding that and placing that, locating that very carefully within it, acknowledging the conditions within which the work is happening. 
Thank you. Thank you, Anushka. Something about the incremental being long term relationships that get built and carry over. Faisal? Yeah, so um, uh, this, uh, what, 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 what my strategy uh, is, is, of course, I'm based out of based in Toronto right now. So everything is remote. Mm. Um, right. Mm. And um, just to bring the premise of the biennial, which is looking into the intersection of art, um, design and technology and looking into the work which are more um, social impactful and art for change. Um, so what my spectrum is, 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 a, is, a, is, is a lot broader. So I'm engaging the artist, I'm engaging with innovation, innovation lab, I'm looking, engaging with the researchers, I'm engaging with the academic and looking into the spectrum of how these intersections are happening across the disciplines. So, and so it, it's a pretty amazing, um, I would say quite intensive, but really um, um, uh, learning and uh, listening and, and, uh, and, uh, and kind of developing this framework for me, which is what I'm working on right now. So creating kind of platforms or stations or kind of scenarios in which you can end up meeting people. Very nice. Shubhuki, you're going to be answering the very last, maybe practically having the last word because we've practically run out of time now. I would, at least for, with due respect to the questioner, I'll ask the last question, but I don't think we'll have time to answer it. So Shubhuki, in response to our, uh, curatorial research. Um, curatorial research, I'd finished most of it before the pandemic actually. Mm -hmm. really hit so i was lucky in that respect but i also have to say that a lot of the research was informed by eight years of continuous travel that i had been doing anyway as an artist mm -hmm. at the when i first started i wanted to separate very much my my work as an artist i don't know why i, I attempted that futile exercise i think part of it was this whole weird idea that apparently there's a kind of ethical muddling that would happen um but actually it really wasn't i then ended up realizing that a lot of the familiarity i had with certain regions helped ensure that the conversations that I had didn't start off at square one, that there was already some pre-existing knowledge then. Plus, I would voraciously read up every time before I went. It really helped also that, as, as Anushka put it, there's a kind of um, um, network of friendships. There's a, there's a, if you work with people before, you know you can rely on their expertise or if they, because they'll be honest if they don't know and they'll then put you in touch with people who do. Um, and let's be very honest for biennales like this, you have you really rely on the goodwill of people to share, to be generous and the people are people are hugely generous. So honestly, curator research is actually really just um, relying on the generosity of people across. And I don't only mean fellow curators or artists. I also mean, um, and, and writers, I mean people outside the art world as well, who support different ways in which you can um, understand um, um, different contexts that some of which I spoke about earlier. So for me, curatorial research is, is not only being awake when you're in a studio or when you're meeting um, the people you're supposed to meet, but just really being having your eyes and op ears open all the time. I suppose that's a really strange way to put it. But uh, for me, that's that's curatorial research and it, it is exhausting, but absolutely worth it. So, um, I mean, and, and I think with the pandemic, with some of it got left over. So when I moved over to sort of uh, digital or sorry, virtual um, studio visits, there's an aspect that that also got unlocked there. Conversations were, were were quite different. And because you couldn't walk around a studio, you couldn't discover things on your own. Um, you were relying very much on what people were showing you. Because of that, there was a more directed and focused approach to these conversations. And when we got that focused um, conversation out of the way towards the end when people relaxed more a lot of very um, exciting conversation happened so I think sometimes the 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 pandemics actually enabled for a virtual studio visit people you wouldn't have gotten the chance to meet because of geography and and funding and money and all of that kind of thing so I, I do I would not say the pandemics only thrown up problems. I think the pandemic has also, to quite an extent, enabled certain forms of curatorial research and networking that we couldn't have done earlier. So I think there's more parity, if I may say that. And of course, 
when I say that I'm working on the assumption that people have access, they have um, uh, internet access, they have, you know, uh, uh, they're able to do this. So there's already it's that, that understanding. Demographics. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But I think that it also creates a certain parity and we shouldn't ignore that, that yeah. um, as well. Excellent. Perfect note to end on. I will still raise the question, the, the one question that we haven't. There's also a, a comment by Tasneem Mehta agreeing with Shubugi, saying that that was well said. This was a while ago. I completely agree with you. And I love the example of the burnt book. There's an anonymous attendee who's asked that does digitizing exhibitions also change interpretations of the art form? Art from a local context is something more universal, which may not be what the artist intended. What are your thoughts on this and how tenable is it? to have online exhibits when after we hopefully go back to normalcy. Now, I, I'm afraid we don't have time to answer this, such but I hope pretty, everyone else can. Yes. Mm, that's such question. an interesting yeah. question. Yeah. It's a good question. That's a paper. Hey, Can you all quickly say something? Academic. Very quickly, please. Yeah. One, one line, one sentence, if possible. Maximum two. Very quickly. Shubugi, you seem to be the most pressed. You start. Oh my God. Oh God. But yes. I'm the, the most long winded. Um, well, That's actually, um, um, a lot of work doesn't function well online. Um, we're talking paintings, prints and so on. Um, a lot doesn't. But I also have to say this. A lot of artists who are, who are on their own reluctant to have their work turn virtual have been surprised by how it actually helps their work evolve. So a number of artists I've worked with whose projects had to change because of the pandemic and had they had to think in terms of an online presence have been surprised at the, at the and pushed towards a form of evolution that they've ended up enjoying. So again, I won't discount that. Excellent. Perfect answer. Wow. So short. Hey, you, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Anishka. Um, just to say very quickly, the internet is a found space, but it's on history, it's on context, it's on relationalities, and the challenge is to curate exhibitions respecting that and in conversation with that, rather than imagine a white cube on a flat yeah. digital interface. So mm. that is something I'm working on as well in various ways, and also, yeah, long answer, but very also very no, nice it's answer. not long. It's perfect, very exciting, perfect. actually. Yes, yeah. Thanks, yeah. Quickly. Yeah, yeah I, I actually back to disagree. I think mm. if if uh, artists who are using internet as a medium has a different inclination. So if you look at their work, there is a sensibility which exists, which resonates with them and with the public as well. Just want to say that. Thank you. Uh, Good. I'm glad we have disagreements also within the panel. Um, on that note, I'd like to thank all of you for your generous time, everyone who's attended for engaging so intently, um, everyone of the panelists for answering so generously, Asia Society and their partners, Bloomberg, for organizing this event. Um, these are conversations that are ongoing, as we can clearly see. So um, wishing the three of you the very best for the Biennales to come. We hope we can see them. Thank you again. And Thank you. Care. Thank you. Thank you very much.